let's start with you, Mark. You, you've had this incredible investing career, recently sold the uh, Milwaukee Bucks, your interest in the Milwaukee Bucks. Congratulations. Got to the championship, which is an incredible thing and very hard to do. What's next? I know you're putting together a fund, uh, sports related. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us a little about what you're thinking about the macro economic landscape. Sure. Uh, one, thank you for having me. Um, it's always good to see you. It's always good to see the little guy. <laughs> um, so, you know, after, I, I think one of the things I've always um, been interested in, obviously, is sports and wanted to do a sports fund because I think going forward, there's this massive interest in sports worldwide. You saw it with the World Cup. You've seen it everywhere. Um, so one of my partners is actually here, Lauren Holiday, um, two-time Olympia so, um, in women's soccer. And one of the things that we thought that we would do is go out and raise capital to invest in women's sports, to invest in sort of, again, basketball teams, to do teams in uh, Africa and Asia, uh, to lend money to teams. So there's this huge opportunity out there, and a lot of it is because of media rights, that going forward, as more and more people watch sports, um, you've got really what you have, it isn't really a sports team, it's a media company. And um, think of all of us here grew up watching uh, sports on TV. Um, if you're in Africa or if you're in Asia, you're not doing it on TV, it's streaming, it's on your phone. And as more and more people are doing that, you're gonna find that there's more and more opportunities on that space. So, you know, hopefully um, we'll do pretty well. And, and you still have that element of a, appointment television with sports. You know, people have to tune in. So It's the only thing that's live. Right. It's the only thing you can't record. Nobody's recording the Super Bowl and saying, I'll watch it in six months, right? You were at the Mets game last night. Nobody's yep. recording that to say, I'm gonna watch it in a couple of days. It's always more fun at the Mets game when the Mets are winning. Especially when you're with Steve, you know, he gets, what I love about Steve Cohen, he's just like the rest of us, he's a real Met fan. So, Alex, you've had this amazing career, and uh, I was just talking to you in the green room. I think one of the things that I admire about you most is your evolution, the way you've adapted, and uh, you're just, you're an A player in everything that you do, A plus player. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about the ups and downs, uh, winning and losing as an athlete, winning and losing in business. Give us yeah, thanks, a Andy. feeling. And thank you for having us uh, here today. You, you know, it's funny. When I think about my career, I played for almost 25 years uh, professionally uh, with Seattle, Rangers, and about 15 with the Yankees. And when people think about my, my career, they think about a lot of things. Part of it is some of the successes, right? The win in championship in, in 09 this morning when I was running in Central Park. Uh, actually walking in Central Park, uh, about five or six people were still thanking me for 2009. So sports is interesting because it creates a great feeling, right? And uh, what people forget to tell you is that I'm fifth all time in the history, fifth all time in the history of strikeouts. Now, that means that only four people in the history of mankind, only four have more strikeouts than me. So I always tell my little girls, like I have a PhD in failing, but I also have a master's in getting back up. And I think in business, that's one of my greatest competitive advantages is I understand how to deal with failure. Because business is tough. Not everyone's going to be like Mark Lazary, where he's going to make 10x in 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of failure that Mark Lazary's had to lead to this great entrepreneur and icon that he is today, both in the hedge fund business and in the sports world. Let's talk about Mark for a second. So I want to know the first time you met him, how did you meet him and had the conversation go? Well, it, it's funny. I'll tell you about Mark. I mean, because Mark is known for a, a lot of things. He does more things than anything. But one of the things that I respect about Mark, it's weird because I, I like talking bad in front of his face, but uh, he's been a great friend and a mentor. And I'll share one little story. It goes back about 15 years when I first met him, Anthony. And I was so excited because we were f launching our first fund. And we we're playing the Red Sox at Yankee Stadium. And we get a little rain. Now, my appointment with him is at his townhouse in the east side, and it was around 10, 30, or 11. So I'm hoping the game goes by pretty quickly. And of course, you get a little rain delay, and then we go into extra innings, and I'm like, oh, there goes my window. And Mark's in the office at 7 in the morning the next day at Avenue. So I don't know if you remember this, but I said, hey, Mark, the game ended like around 12. I said, I'm sorry I missed the window. 
Uh, maybe we'll do it in the next few weeks. He goes, what are you talking about? Just come over and knock on my door. So around 12.15, I knock on the door. He comes out in his pajamas. And literally for the next hour and a half, he's sitting with his glasses going through my PPM, Xing, Ying. Uh, then he became an investor. He's still my investor. We made him a lot of money. Yes, he and, did. Uh, but it's things like that that nobody knows about Lazary that really makes him and his family All such. right, so now, now we're going to go to Mark in his pajamas. And you, <laughs> Mark's daughter's in the front row. She's loving this. Okay, so were they like Brioni pajamas? Or <laughs> were, they, were they shabby chic? Or what was going on? They were velvet. Yeah. All right, so, 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 so you, you see something in Alex Rodriguez that obviously I see in Alex Rodriguez. So why'd you make the investment in Alex Rodriguez at, at 12, 15 in the morning in your pajamas? Because at the end of the day, and I, and I think we all see this, Alex had a huge desire to succeed, right? And was willing to make sure that he wouldn't fail. And I think a lot of what we try to do with investors is you're trying to find people who are gonna succeed. Right, there, there's nobody that we haven't met. There's no manager that comes to you and says, oh, by the way, invest with me, I'm gonna do horrible, <laughs> right? I mean, everybody's like, I'm gonna do really well. And we're all gonna make bets. And I thought Alex was super focused on trying to make sure that he was gonna do well on the real estate side. I thought he had a bit of an edge that other people weren't gonna have. And he had a great team. And I wanted to take a chance. And I thought at the end of the day that if anybody was gonna make it work, he would. And he's been able to build a phenomenal business on the real estate side, as he said. He's actually made us a great deal of money, much more than he thought mm -hmm. than when we talked about. So um, it's turned out to be a great investment for us and for our family. So, so Mark, let me ask you just a follow-up question because we both have had our various ups and downs and our careers. In a, in a down moment in your career, uh, what are you thinking about? How do you frame your mindset? I want to ask you this too, because I think it's important for sports and business, but. I, I think it's really hard. It's, you know, everybody always tells you, look, don't worry, when something goes down, uh, just buy more, right? I mean, that's sort of what we all learned in business school. And it's really hard because the market is telling you that you're totally wrong. Right? You bought something at 70, it's now at 50. So that means everybody else is telling you what you're doing is wrong and you're still buying at 50. And I, I, the part that's hard is still having the conviction when everybody's on top of you and telling you that you're wrong. And I think that's sort of what separates people. Ultimately, you're either right or you're not, right? I mean, I think for Alex, it's the same thing. Everybody's expecting you, you know, when a ball's coming at you, it, 95 miles an hour, um, everybody wants you to hit it, or half the, sta you know, the stadium wants you to hit it, and there's a bunch of other people who don't want you to hit that ball, they right. want you to strike out. When you're making an investment, you're hoping you're right, and you've got to keep on betting on yourself, and I think, you know, you, you've been great at that, I mean, because it's hard, and no, everybody who tells you it's easy, it isn't, and the only way you're gonna be able to succeed is to bet on yourself. And hopefully if you're right, you're gonna do well. And if you're not, nobody's gonna ask you to come back on this stage. Oh, totally, you know, it, it, took, it took me, well, you're always gonna be on my stage, it took me about 30 minutes to get my hair to look like this with the blow dryer this morning, I'm just blowing <laughs> it. And I'm watching CNBC and there is Martha Stewart. Okay, she's on the cover of Sports Illustrated this week. <laughs> And they're interviewing, you know, Joe Kernan's a friend of mine, he's interviewing, I'm thinking, Martha Stewart is one of the most resilient people. I mean, you could follow her career. I have such respect for her. Um, and I, I have respect for the two of you, but there's something about getting up, isn't there, Alex? When things are not going well, you get up, you dust yourself off, and you keep going. Yeah, no doubt, Anthony. Look, the thing is, like from my experience, again, playing 25 years of professional sports, being at Yankee Stadium, having the luxury to play seven days a week in front of 54,000 fans, especially at the old stadium, you recognize the ability to stay really, really calm while the waters are really, really choppy. And when you're facing Randy Johnson and Pedro Martinez and he strikes you out the first two times, you've got about 45 minutes to make your adjustment in real time. Um, so when you now transfer to the business community, uh, here we are in COVID, 
Uh, you look at the trailing 12, there's no one going to your arenas, empty, you have the bubble. And at that time, I was able to slow it down, just like after two strikeouts, to say, the Timberwolves. The opportunity came about. We, take a, we took a great run at the Mets. We raised $2.4 billion, and the big guy, Steve Cohen, paid 2.45, and thank God he did. A, because he's super rich, and B, he's doing a great job with the Mets. And it allowed me the opportunity to say, okay, this is a pretty good asset, is an incredible league, and we're buying it for a billion five, strike price 1.35 of equity. And I said, while the world was kind of thinking about what's next, we moved the seven days, we shook hands, and today we own the Timberwolves. I, I, I love the story, but there's, there's something else going on under the surface that I want you to tell people. Uh, and this is just my personal observation of you. Um, you train, you think about business, the same way you thought about sports. How am I gonna get to the top? Uh, you have mentors like Mark Lazary, Jerry Reinsdorf, Warren Buffett. Uh, tell us about the personality that it takes to reach out to other people in the world and draw from them and, and constantly replenish your, your well of knowledge and business acumen. Anthony, it's the same thing I did in baseball. Like if I was facing uh, a West Coast pitcher and I hadn't seen him in three or four weeks, and Mark plays for the Oakland A's, I would call Mark and say, hey, tell me what Anthony threw to you. And we'll spend 15, 20 minutes breaking down your fastball, your curveball, your tendencies. This is before data and analytics was so in our face and our iPads. We had to actually go out and do the due diligence. And I had like 50 binders of all my scouting reports that I would write, like I was writing today. Like I have this thing, if I don't write it, I don't remember it. I do that in TV and I do that in my prep. And at night, I always have my little notebook. If I think of something, and I've done it in the middle of the night, I'll come up and I'll write it so I don't forget it in the morning. So th that's just, I I'm a pattern recognition. I didn't go like to college. I didn't go to like get my MBA, but I just learned the unconventional way. And the more information, the more data I get, the better decisions I make. And more importantly, what I learned early, Anthony, I remember playing at Tropical Park in Miami uh, when I was 12 years old. And you know, you play a lot of pickup basketball, Mark. And what I realized was this, there's 50 people, but only 10 can play at the same time. And what I realized when I was 12 is you need the best team so you stay on the court for three or four hours because if you lose, you're out for two hours. So what I recognized is I had to get the best people and if we had the best people, we would play longer. That's exactly what I've done in baseball and in business. It's good, yeah, I love the comment. You're, you're, you're in an interesting and weird macro environment. Uh, Steve Cohen said last night, I said, Steve, give me the macro environment. Steve's of the belief, Mark, that interest rates are gonna go lower. Uh, a, a combination of supply chain reconnection, AI, other big onboards of technology, pushing prices down, and he thinks the Fed is going to pause and start cutting rates sooner than other people. And so he said the, the prices of stocks are going up. He said that in front of 150 people last night. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree with him, disagree with him? Where do you think we are in the macroeconomic environment? I actually don't think it's that complicated. Um, I think Steve's right for a simple reason. <clears throat> I would simplify it even more. The Fed is worried about one thing, inflation, right? That's why rates went up. So when you go into a recession or when inflation stops going up and now inflation is coming down, it's at around five, six percent. So what is the Fed going to worry about next? A recession. So what do you do when you're in a recessionary environment? You lower rates. So the Fed, once the Fed stops worrying about inflation, it worries about recession. So rates will start coming down. And the question is when? So, you know, whether that happens in three months, six months, nine months, rates are gonna start coming down. So the Fed has already told you they're gonna lower rates. For some reason, people don't believe it. People are still nervous but rates will come down in the next six months. So if there's anybody out Bullish. there from Bloomberg or anyone, mark my words, within six months, rates will start coming down. Sort of same question for you, Alex. When you see your business portfolio, do you agree with these guys? You think we're heading into a more benign rate environment? I think interest rates will come down. We've been fairly the sidelines for a long time. But again, with this environment, it creates opportunities. We're starting to get phone calls on assets that we've wanted to buy for 10 or 12 years and they haven't been available. Today, they're starting to take our calls. There's still a disconnect between buyers and sellers, 
uh, the sellers think is worth 10, we think is worth three. And over time, they're gonna get a little bit short in time. And I think there'll be a lot of opportunities and there's what, uh, about a trillion dollars of debt coming due here pretty soon. And uh, there'll be some tremendous opportunities on the real estate side. But think, think of what Alex just said, because it's, I, I hope everybody sort of heard it. It used to be seller thinks it's 10, we're at seven. Right, and there was, you were gonna to try to meet in the middle. The problem right now is valuations on a lot of things have gone down quite a bit. And the discounts of where there's a, a mark to market on it and where people are willing to buy it, it's not like a 20% discount, it's a 50, 60% discount. So that is massive. And that's gonna take a while for sellers to come down to that level. But Alex is absolutely right about that. I didn't get the chance to congratulate you, Mark, but I have to congratulate you. Uh, uh, I congratulated the last Saul Conference for winning the NBA championship, uh, but you also did something amazing in the investment world. You bought an asset from the Cole family. Uh, I think you spent about $550 million on that asset. And a couple of weeks ago, you sold the asset for a $3.5 billion valuation, at least your, your interest in it. So congratulations on that, Mazel Tov. Uh, but this... The question I have is how and why? What did you see in 2014 and why did you sell and how did you build it uh, into the great franchise that it currently is? Um, well, when we bought it, we thought we were buying into a media company and that you were gonna have a new TV contract and we thought we'd own it for a couple of years. Um, found out that absolutely loved it and that I think it was one of the um, best investments but also one of the most fun things I've ever done. Um, I would tell you the, one, the way we won a championship was that we had phenomenal players. You know, that in essence you build a culture and that you know, we got very lucky when we bought the team, Giannis was on the team and didn't know at the time that he was going to turn out to be one of the two or three best players. Um, you know, I think the key to us winning was we made a huge decision at the time in bringing Drew Holiday um, to our team. And that ended up being the missing piece. And because of that, that year we won a championship. I think as to why I sold, part of it is I thought values had gone up quite a bit. It felt like it was the right time. We'll find out in five years if it was or not. But either way, it was, it was a huge amount of money for our family. And I wanted to invest in different things. And that's sort of why I wanted to do the sports fund. But I thought there was an, you know, another direction I wanted to go. Well, listen, you, huge congratulations to you. Talking about team, Alex, you, you, you've worked on a lot of different teams. Uh, you're building a great team. I've had the opportunity to meet many of your people in your company. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the elements that go into recruiting, um, evaluating people, keeping them together, uh, rowing yeah. the boat in the same direction. And Anthony, I don't think Mark uh, gives himself enough credit. I think as a player, I would have, it would have been a dream to play for such a progressive thinker, uh, someone who understands 360, the entire business. But if you allowed me, in 1973, January 3rd, uh, GMS, George M. Steinbrenner bought the New York Yankees for a little bit north of $10 million. Uh, he bought that asset from CBS. And he's owned that asset, the family still owns it and controls it, for almost, almost 50 years. Well, that $10 million investment with 11 or 12 of his LPs Today, the conglomerate is worth north of 10 billion, maybe 15 billion. When you add the Yankees, the Yet Yes Network is just a cash cow, throws off about 450 of EBITDA, plus or minus, and it's just that. So whether you own an asset, these media companies, for five decades or one decade, uh, you can do incredibly well. And, and then it comes down to people. What I learned from George Steinbrenner was VCP. You have to have the vision, right? You have to deploy the capital, and then the hardest part always is recruiting the best people in the world, pay them a lot of money. You can never overpay for a 10 talent. I found that when you bring in A's, they bring other A's. When you recruit B's, they bring in C's. 
Oh, we, we, did, we, we, we know that in politics too, Alex. We've learned that too. So, <laughs> so, but but let, me, let, me, let me ask a follow-up if you don't mind. Um, you, you're an A player, uh, but you've been an A player in sports. You've been an A player in announcing. You've had this incredible business success. Uh, it's hard to do that, frankly. So what is it about A-Rod that allows you to do that? How do you fill your time? How do you put your day together? First of all, I got to tell you, Anthony, my ex-players, uh, my former teammates just think I'm absolutely nuts. And they're partly right. Um, but they don't understand why I'm in the office five, six days a week, suit and tie. They, they always tell me you should be on a boat. You should be smoking a cigar. You should be... And I, I may do that for a week or two out of the year with my family, but he, trust me, he likes this outfit. <laughs> you, you and I know how to dress. You know, I was upset this morning because you're always dressed better than me. And then I saw Mark Lazar, I felt better about myself. <laughs> but then again, I don't have, then again, I don't have Mark's balance sheet, right? Okay, but you know, when I see Mark, I remind, remind myself how poor I am. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. When I see Mark, I said, man, I gotta work harder. Okay, so, but, but, but go to, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to tease out of you, and I'll just say it yeah. um, bluntly, I just really admire your adaptability. I admire your strength through adversity. I admire your commercial instincts. And you're just saying you're just working hard, but there's something else going no, I, on. I, 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 want, I want you to explain to this audience what the X factor is. Yeah, I think the X factor is, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a son of immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. I was born in Washington Heights, a few miles away from Yankee Stadium. My mom worked two jobs when pops left at the age of 10. And she was a secretary in the morning. She served tables at night. We were lifelong renters. That's why I got involved with real estate. I mean, simply said, you know, average career for a baseball player, three data points is five and a half years. You make 90% of your lifetime income from age 20 to 30 and less percent of the five, less than 5% of MLB roster has a college degree. So I looked at those three data points and I was short. And that's why a lot of these players ended up going bankrupt. So I ended up buying real estate because I thought it was a perfect hedge. If I played for 10 years and I buy one asset a year, over time as my window closes of W-2 income coming from the Yankees, that my, it would increase, my asset would increase both in appreciation and in cash flow. And that was my simple answer for not going broke. But I, I will say one other thing is when I came to the New York Yankees, um, it was a culture shock. Because what George Steinbrenner built in 50 years is basically what Mark Lazary did in uh, one fifth of the time, which was winning looks different. And it's not just what you see at Yankee Stadium or in the network, but let me bring you inside the clubhouse for 30 seconds. When I got to Yankee Stadium, and we, whether you won or lost, three strikers or three home runs, guys like Derek Jeter, Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams, Mariano Rivera, Andy Pettit, they took their jock at the end of the game, after disappointing loss, heartbreaking, and they would hand it to a clubhouse attendant, not throw it on the floor, right? Whether they hit a home run or not, they said, thank you, yes ma'am, no ma'am. And it's not just the haircuts that George made us cut, I didn't have that problem, or a beard, I was good on those. But it was just the discipline, the culture, and the way we thought about respecting others. And that's really what made us champions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something I really respect about you. you, you your staff loves you, Mark. Um, I guess, you know, because I obviously have been in your funds and I know a lot of people that you've invested in and they always say this about you, that you're there to help, you're there to enable them. So part of the battle is getting the right investment, but the secondary part of the, the battle is helping sometimes the investment. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell a little bit about your activism, how you think about activism, how you think about uh, helping the, uh, people that you're putting your capital with? Look, I think at the end of the day, in all these investments, um, you've got to be very involved. <clears throat> you've got to be active, because if you're not, um, somebody else is going to be active on the other side, right? So somebody, you know, in the business we're all in, somebody, if you're the senior debt, or you're the unsecured debt, or the, you're the equity, somebody is getting crushed. <laughs> Right, somebody is going to get hurt. So you've got to be very active. You've got to try to do it in a in a professional way, um, because you're going to see that same party three months later, six months later, in another deal. So I think for us, um, we want to be extremely active. We want to make sure we're going to make a difference. 
Um, I think that's the only way today that you can make money. Um, so when we're investing, we're going to get on the creditors committees. We're going to do all these different things. One of the things I wanted to add about, you know, Alex and I were talking about it. I don't know if people appreciate there's only two athletes in the history of sports that actually have played and then have gone on to buy one of the four or five major professional uh, sports teams here in the U.S. So Michael Jordan is one. You may have heard of him. Um, and then the other one is Alex in, and doing it in a sport that he didn't play. Um, he might have wanted to play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but, Not too many Dominicans in the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a pretty rare feat. And it talks about, you know, when you sort of talk about people who are going to make you money and who are going to do different things, um, there are people who have an uncanny ability to succeed in a lot of different things. And you, we all sort of bump into those people. I would tell you, whoever those people are that you bump into, you definitely want to invest in. Because, you know, one of the things we try to find, and I think you do too, is we're all trying to find money makers, people who make you money, right? There's a lot of really smart analysts. There's a lot of really talented people, but there's very few money makers, people who will make you money in any market. You were going to say something. Yeah, I wanted just to add to, to Mark, because I, I like, you know, when I talk to my team, I always like to give them an example uh, rather than like these big headlines. Uh, I like to pick examples and then have an opportunity to coach and teach a little bit. But one of the things that I think makes Mark very unique is he never makes you feel bad about yourself, right? And it's so easy to just say, nope, that's not what I do. We're an institution. Nope, that's not what I do. No, 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 no. Mark always says like, okay, I'm still listening. Open heart, open mind. And I think because of that, he has more deal flow than anybody. But not only did he invest millions and millions of dollars with A-Rod Corp, but he also helped us build the business, how to think about it in good times and bad times. Him being a dead guy, he's always going to be risk averse, but he has tremendous ways to bring value on the equity side as well. So I think just from all of us, uh, you don't know when the best idea is going to come from. And the smartest people in the world are always the most thirsty for information, inquisitive and willing to help. And that's what Mark is. Tell us, uh, Alex, tell us about the A-Rod Corp 5 and 10 year plan. Where are we in 28, 2028, 2033? Well, Anthony, I've been lucky enough to, um, <laughs> Mark and I laugh about this. We've had extraordinary success in real estate. I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I have a guy by the name of Stuart Zook, who's been around, he worked for Sam Zell for about 13 years, went public and private markets ran several billion dollar book and I was able to get him at a really hard time in 08 and he cleaned up the books and then we've been writing pretty good for the last 13 or 14 years. Multifamily has been an incredible uh, attractive asset class and, and we kind of keep it very simple. Workforce housing, Southeast US, average buys 140,000 per door, average rent is 12 to 1600 per door. Uh, we've acquired over the last 20 years over 20,000 multifamily. We've acquired uh, with our friend Barry Ster uh, Sternlet as my partner, uh, almost 10,000 single family houses and about half a dozen hotels. So that's what we've done, where we're going today, hopefully to continue to do exactly what we've done. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We just want to do what we do, stick to, as Warren says, in, in our circle of competence and keep hitting that ball right down the middle. You're marketing a uh, sports fund right now. You're, you're, you're open investing. Uh, tell us about the goals of the sports fund. Tell us about uh, where you see that over the next couple of years. I think if you sort of think about where are the opportunities, right? Where is it in the U.S.? Is it outside the United States? Um, and if you think about it being like a media company, uh, over the course of the next five years, so I'll try to make it easy for everybody here. Who here watches the Olympics? Raise your hand. Who watched what? The Olympics. Yeah. You ever heard of it? Yeah. It's kind of. Right. Kind of. Okay. Make it simple. All right. Does anybody watch Better curling in the Olympics? That, right? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. If you're watching curling, you'll watch anything on TV. <laughs> I Just watch. Think, but it's think like, about that. It's like Italian bocce on ice. But, I, mean, I, got, I got a horse, I'm watching it. You're watching curling. So. The reason you're watching curling is you're watching the best in the world compete. That's why you're watching. Right. People want to see that. 
So if you're going to see that and you've got a new generation of younger people, they want to watch more women in sports. They want to watch more sports. And then you've got this other thing that's happening in sports today called gambling. Who here gambles on sports? Yeah, you can all raise your hand. It's uh, okay. Who's? <laughs> it was like this. Uh, who's being dishonest and <laughs> saying they're not gambling on sports? Okay, good. Right. Sorry. And what you're seeing is as more and more people are watching sports and gambling on sports, we're not talking, you're talking about a dollar, five dollars. You're, what you're going to find is there's more engagement. One of the things that was funny about COVID was, I don't know for those of you here, but a lot of people didn't come to the office, right? People were working at home because they were worried about COVID. Yet people would go into a stadium of 20,000 people to go watch a sporting event because everybody knew COVID didn't go into sporting events, right? And you sort of, why did people do that? And the reason people did that is because people want to be part of a community. People want to be part of things. And you're going to see more and more of that going forward. And that's sort of one of the reasons why I wanted to invest more in sports. I want to invest in women's sports. I want to invest in teams in Africa, teams in Asia, teams in Europe, where the values an NBA basketball team is worth anywhere between sort of three to $7 billion. You can buy a basketball team in Africa today for $5 million that seems to be a huge disconnect, right? You want to be able to take advantage of that the world is growing. You've got a billion five people in Africa who love sports. You're going to have more and more of that. So that's where the opportunities are going to be going forward. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah, please, of course. So, so if you just, you know, Mark is talking very global, but if we just simplify it to the United States, uh, there's 92 teams, MLB, NBA, NFL, 92 teams approximately you have an enterprise of those 92 teams of about half a trillion dollars. Now think about this for a minute. Of the half a trillion dollars, 90% or so is equity. So you have this incredible asset class that is fairly easy to underwrite and predict. That's what we want as investors. And yet you only have 10% debt. Now that should get you excited. Now if you think about you're sitting in your seat with your CIO hat on. I'm like, how can we participate in about half a billion, uh, $500 billion of illiquid assets? How do we bring capital at many levels, but focus on three at the general partner level, which is what Mark and I was and I'm about to be at the team co level, right? And, and then at the hold co level. So there's extraordinary opportunities. And I think if you think about what's going to happen in 10 years in sports, a little bit to Mark's point about being media companies, I see a world where markets like Minnesota, for example, if we join with the five heads, the Vikings, uh, the, the, the hockey, we own the Lynx as well, the WNBA, and the Twins, these teams are getting so expensive. I think you come together, including the regional sports networks, almost what Ted Leonis is doing, and I think you have a public event, right? Because you, you can buy a, a regional sports network for probably three or four, four times, hockey for seven times. But when you aggregate them together, you can maybe get a 20 or 25 X revenue. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where the world could go in 10 years. But that's just my thought. No, that's interesting. But so we got a couple of minutes left. Give you a, a minute each. We have young people streaming in. Um, give some advice, Mark Lazary, to young people about their careers, getting started, where the world's going what they should be thinking about. Look, I know it sounds a bit banal, but um, you got to work really hard. <laughs> like, it, there, there's nothing like hard work. Um, and one of the things that I always find fascinating, um, I was on a panel and I was there, um, Allison Felix, and if you sort of think about sort of just athletes and Olympic athletes. She said something that was fascinating that I think we should all keep in mind. She said she trains for four years and it's all about 20 seconds because she's, she runs and you know, does track and field. Think about that. 
you're spending a huge amount of your life for literally to compete for 20 seconds. And if, and if you're off by one second, it's not great. So what is that? It's dedication. It's hard work. It's the same thing in business. If you want to succeed, you've got to work harder than everybody else. Because if you don't, there's somebody else who's willing to do it. And that's sort of one of the things I found. You know, when Alex kids around and says, yeah, let's meet at midnight or one in the morning. The reason I want to do that is because if I don't, then I may miss an opportunity. And so if you want to succeed, you've got to work exceptionally hard. There's no, there's no shortcut. No shortcut. Uh, Amen. And you know, that's the one thing you find, right? And I think you've seen that. Yeah. Um, you see it as an athlete, but you also find it in business. The people who want to do well, and if you're starting out your career, work exceptionally hard, and you will find that luck will follow you. Yeah, I think my, my final is that, you know, I think um, being in the moment and being connected is the greatest gift. I have two daughters, 18 and 14. Uh, so if you haven't told you, Natasha will be a freshman at University of Michigan next year. Uh, Jeff Blau will be very proud of that. Um, and we have what is called Sunday Club, which every Sunday at 8.30 in the morning to 10 for 90 minutes, I sit with my girls and there's no phones, no iPads, old school conversation like we're having. And I'm gonna steal a, a little uh, advice that John Gray gave me, who has four daughters and I have two. And the advice that I give my girls is, uh, you know, keep your cool and never give up. And, and if you can stay connected in the moment and put the phones away, uh, I don't look at my phone till noon because it's important for me to start my day focused on my health, my mind, give me an ability to think outside the box. Today I walked Central Park for an hour and those are where your, some of your greatest thoughts come and then be connected and be in the moment because your competition, A, they're not showing up, B, they don't want to work hard or show, show up to the office. When you're walking Central Park, just out of curiosity, you get your phones in, listen to a book, you're oh, with your own thoughts. What do you do in Central Park when you're walking for an hour? No, today I walked with my girlfriend, so I, if I had headphones, she probably would have dumped me. Yeah, exactly. But all right, well, no, all right, all right. It was a great walk. when you're walking without the girlfriend, of course. Yeah, usually a podcast. Give your karate chop and the app, Adam's apple, but yeah. Yeah, but you got to give yourself, you know, slow down to speed up is kind of what I call it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Guys, ex exceptional stuff. I'm so grateful to the two of you for joining us here at the Salt Conference. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mark Lassie.